Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the different types of lipid molecules. Okay, right. Uh, so, we're in the process of discussing the sphingolipids, which are based on the structure of sphingosine. Now, before we can discuss uh, what a sphingolipid is, we firstly need to discuss uh, what a ceramide is. Now, again, Ceramide is not a single molecule, it is a whole family of molecules, okay? And basically, the way you go from a sphingosine molecule, which is just one molecule, to a ceramide molecule, uh, is you bind a long-chain carboxylic acid group to this amino group of the second carbon here uh, to form an amide bond. Okay, so let's just draw that out. So let's firstly just redraw out our structure of sphingosine. So here's the first carbon with an alcohol group coming off. Then off this second carbon, we have the amino group. This amino group is now going to be involved in an amide link to some long-chain carboxylic acid here. Okay, so in the formation of an amide link, what you do is you take off the hydrogen well, you take off one of the hydrogen atoms off this nitrogen atom. You take off the alcohol group from the carboxylic acid molecule. You bind those two together to make water, and you bind the carbon of the carboxylic acid group to the nitrogen of the amino group. Then here is the third carbon of our sphingosine molecule, which has an alcohol group coming off like so. Then here's our fourth carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, and a double bond between the fourth and the fifth carbon, and then the rest of the molecule is then really boring. Okay, so you then have 12 methylene groups like so. So here's one, we'll bracket it, and then put a 12 around it, and then we have our methyl group right on the end. So this is the structure of a ceramide, basically. Okay, and again, you'll see that it's not one type of molecule. It's not one molecule. It's a whole class of molecules, okay? Because this R group here can be any old long-chain carboxylic acid here, basically. So there's a uh, variable here that we can change and therefore produce many different types of ceramides. Okay, right. Now... Basically, what you do is you take a ceramide molecule, and from a ceramide molecule, you can now create what is known as a sphingolipid. So, let me show you what a sphingolipid is. So, basically, sphingolipids are all going to now have something else attached onto this alcohol group of the first carbon, basically. Okay? So, to create a sphingolipid, what you're going to do is substitute in something off this alcohol group on the first carbon of the ceramide molecule. Okay, right. So there are different classes of sphingolipids. Okay, so let's now discuss the first of these classes. And basically, the different classes will uh, correspond to different substitutions that you can make onto, whoops, we've missed off the P, okay, sphingolipids. Okay, so the different classes that you can produce will correspond to the different things that you can substitute onto that first carbon's alcohol groups. So the first class of sphingolipids are going to be called sphingomyelins, okay, and these are um, going to be considered phospholipids, basically, because uh, they are going to have... Um, phosphate um, groups within the structures that you are going to add on to the alcohol group of that first carbon of uh, the um, ceramide molecule. Okay, so let me discuss examples of things that you can attach onto that first alcohol group of the ceramide molecule, uh, which will lead you to be considered a sphingomyelin. Okay, so for instance, you can add on a phosphocholine molecule, okay, and then you will be considered a sphingomyelin, okay? So what's the structure of a phosphocholine molecule? Well, we know what a choline molecule is, okay, so it's this uh, two-carbon molecule where you have an alcohol group at one end, okay, and I won't draw the hydrogen on that alcohol group, and then you have nitrogen on the other end with three methyl groups coming off it. So that's choline. 
Now, how do we convert this into uh, phosphocholine? Well, basically, we link the alcohol group of the choline molecule to a phosphate group via a phosphoester link, and that produces us phosphocholine. Okay, we then have this free group over here, which can then interact with another alcohol group to form another phosphoester link. And basically, what we're going to do is uh, bind that other free side of the phosphate group to this alcohol group of the ceramide molecule to create uh, what will be considered a sphingomyelin. Okay, and because it's got this phosphate group here, and we've also got a long chain carboxylic acid in our structure over here, uh, then that will be considered a phospholipid. Another example of a sphingomyelin would be if we substituted a phosphoethanolamine group onto um, the first carbon of that ceramide molecule. Okay, so what is the structure of a phosphoethanolamine molecule? Well, basically, it's almost identical to the structure of phosphocholine that we've just discussed. And you have your uh, two carbons here, your two methylene groups, sometimes called an ethylene group. And then on the other side, you have this amino group here. Okay, and on, then on this side, you're going to have the alcohol group. And this, of course, is going to be linked via a phosphoester link to a phosphate group here, like so. Okay, and basically what you can then do, again, is use this free alcohol group on this side, along with this phosphorus atom doubly bound to an oxygen, which we know resembles a carboxylic acid group. We can use this to bind to that alcohol group of the first carbon of the ceramide molecule. And when we do that, we will get a molecule that will be considered a sphingomyelin. So all of these uh, sphingomyelins are considered sphingolipids, but they're specifically sphingolipids within the class of sphingomyelins. Now, not only that, because they have the phosphate uh, group within their structure, when we attach these groups onto ceramides, these sphingomyelins will be considered phospholipids, basically. Okay, so these are the examples of uh, sphingolipids, which will be considered phospholipids. So these are the examples of the phospholipids, which are not in the category of phosphoglycerolipids, and are instead in the category of sphingolipids. Now, as their name suggests, they are hugely present within myelin that surrounds neurons, but they are also present within uh, the normal phospholipid bilayer that surrounds all cells. Okay, so sphingomyelins are also considered uh, phospholipids. Okay, now let's talk about uh, other types of sphingolipids. So the other type of sphingolipids uh, would be considered glycosphingolipids. Okay, and basically glycosphingolipids are when you substitute a carbohydrate group uh, oops, we've done glycosphingosphingolipids. Okay, so get rid of one of those sphingos. Glycosphingolipids. Okay, so glycosphingolipids are where you substitute a carbohydrate group onto this alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the ceramide. So if you substitute in a carbohydrate group off there, uh, then it will be considered a glycosphingolipid. Now this doesn't need to just be one carbohydrate molecule. It doesn't just need to be a single monosaccharide. It can be uh, more than just one single uh, carbohydrate molecule. So basically, it can be a little uh, group of carbohydrate molecules, they're all bound together. But the idea is that you attach some sort of sugar-based molecule onto the ceramide to create a glycosphingolipid. Okay, right. So, uh, a special example of a glycosphingolipid would be a cerebroside. Okay? And basically, cerebrocytes are where you attach a single monosaccharide onto uh, the uh, ceramide structure. So let's draw our picture of the ceramide uh, structure out again. Okay, so here's the first carbon, okay, uh, with its alcohol group on it. And of course, I won't draw the hydrogen coming off the alcohol group because we're going to substitute something on there instead. Okay. Then off the second carbon, we have the amino group, which is in an amide link to some long-chain carboxylic acid here. 
of the third carbon, we have an alcohol group as well, which I'll draw here. Okay, of the fourth carbon, we then have this double bond to the uh, fifth carbon, and then of each of those carbons involved in that double bond, we have a single hydrogen, and then we have uh, 12 methylene groups, like so, so here's one methylene group, we'll repeat that 12 times to get 12 methylene groups, and then finally we have a methyl group right on the end, and that creates as our 18 carbon ceramide. Okay, right. So, to turn this into a cerebroside, which are a type of glycosphingolipid, you substitute a single uh, monosaccharide in here. Now, basically, you can either substitute galactose or glucose. Okay? So, if you bind galactose onto the alcohol group of the ceramide molecule, uh, then the cerebroside you get is the cerebroside which is found in the um, cell membranes of neurons. Okay, so this uh, cerebroside is found in neuronal cell membranes. Okay, if instead you substitute glucose onto that alcohol group of the ceramide uh, molecule, then the cerebroside that you will get uh, is what's found on all non-neuronal cell bodies. Okay, so non-neuronal cell membranes, rather. Okay, uh, so basically, um, these cerebrocytes are found in cell membranes. And in if your cell is a neuron, then the cerebrocyte you will find has a galactose substituted on the alcohol group of that first carbon of the uh, cere ceramide molecule. Okay, and... If your cell is not a neuron, okay, so we're talking about a non-neuronal cell membrane, then the monosaccharide which you substitute onto the alcohol group of the first carbon of the ceramide structure is a glucose monosaccharide. Okay, so uh, that's what cerebrocytes are. They're basically ceramides where you have a single monosaccharide molecule added onto the alcohol group uh, of the first carbon of the ceramide structure. Okay, and they are all examples of glycosphingolipids. Okay, but as I say, cerebrocytes are very simple glycosphingolipids. You can have more complicated carbohydrate structures coming off this first alcohol group of the ceramide structure. Okay, so another category of sphingolipids Okay, which some people would regard as a type of glycosphingolipid, um, are the gangliosides. Okay, and basically, these have massive great carbohydrate groups coming off the um, alcohol group of the first carbon of the ceramide structure. So basically, you'll have loads of sugars joined together, and that entire structure will hang off the side of your ceramide structure. And when that's the case, that's called a gangliocide, basically. Now, gangliocides have an important role in uh, signaling, basically. Often they are, uh, they function as receptors, and they're usually in the uh, outer leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Okay, right. Uh, but some people would consider gangliosides as um, members of the glycosphingolipid family, since glycosphingolipid really just meant um, a ceramide structure where the um, group that you've added on to the alcohol group that comes off the first carbon is a carbohydrate structure, okay, which these gangliosides do satisfy. Okay, so, for instance, an example would be uh, that the gangliocide which recognizes cholera toxin, um, okay, so cholera toxin binds to a gangliocide uh, on the uh, outer surface of the cell membrane, basically, and that's how it gains access to the cell. Okay, right. So, there we have now finished our discussion of sphingolipids. Okay, and these are other very important components of the uh, lipid bilayer. So, you have glycosphingolipids and ganglicides also in the lipid bilayer, even though those are not phospholipids.
the sphingomyelins are also members of the lipid bile there, uh, and but they are phospholipids. This is why it's probably best to call cell membranes the lipid bilayers rather than phospholipid bilayers, because in the phospholipid bilayer you do actually have uh, lipids which are not phospholipids. Okay, so it's better to call the phospholipid bilayer the lipid bilayer. Okay, right. So the final type of lipid molecule I want to discuss in this video is cholesterol, okay? Uh, so cholesterol is completely different from all the others. It has a massive, great steroid structure, okay? So I'm going to start off with what is the structure of a steroid, then we'll talk about what the structure of a sterol is, and then we'll finally talk about the structure of cholesterol. Okay, so basically, a steroid is not a biological definition. Many people would think that a steroid was some uh, molecule defined by its biological activity. However, a steroid is actually defined by its chemical structure. Okay, so to be a steroid, you have to have a very large uh, multi-ringed structure, which I'm about to draw for you. Okay, now, people always draw uh, steroid structures with skeletal structures because they just look hideous if you draw them molecularly. Whereas, if you draw them skeletally, they look actually horrendously simple. Okay, so basically, this is the structure of a steroid. So, you have these three six-membered carbon rings here. So, one, two, and then three. Okay, you then have this five-membered carbon ring here, okay, and they're all sort of joined together. And if you have a structure that looks like this within your structure, then you will be called a steroid. Okay, right. So, what then is a sterol? Okay, so to convert a steroid into a sterol, all you do is stick an alcohol group off this carbon here. Now, I should just say, We've drawn the skeletal structure here, which is why it looks so simple, because you don't show carbons, they are shown by these corners, and you don't show hydrogens coming off carbons, which is why all these carbons look as though they've got missing bonds. So, for instance, if we look at this one here, it's missing two bonds, but those will both be to hydrogens, and that's why drawing the skeletal formula is so easy, because most of the bonds aren't even shown, basically. Okay, so... In the case of a sterol, you take one of the hydrogens that comes off this carbon down here off, and you put an alcohol group there instead. Okay, and that creates your sterol. So, you will be called a sterol if you have this structure within your structure. Okay, so cholesterol is a sterol because it's going to have this sterol structure within its structure. So, let's now draw cholesterol. Okay, so let me just highlight the bits that apply to sterol. Now, let's draw the bits that are specific for cholesterol. So, basically, in cholesterol, you have a double bond there. Okay, so this is our first portion that is specific to cholesterol. Okay, you then have two methyl groups coming off, one there and one there. So, I highlight those up. There's one methyl group. There's another methyl group. Okay, and then finally, off this carbon up here, and unfortunately I don't really have the space to show this, so I'm going to have to draw this coming up right up here, basically. Okay, so basically you then have a structure that looks like this. Okay, so one carbon there, second carbon there, third carbon there, fourth carbon there, fifth carbon there, sixth carbon there, and then you have these two methyl groups sticking off the side. So that's drawn skeletally, basically. So what you've done is you've added on one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, six carbon, with two methyl groups sticking off like so. And that structure then is cholesterol. Okay, so as you can see, apart from the one alcohol group down here, which is polar, the rest of the cholesterol molecule is extremely neutral, which means that it's extremely hydrophobic. And basically, this is another extremely important uh, component of lipid bilayers. So you have loads of cholesterol molecules within lipid bilayers. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the uh, different types of lipid molecules.